Welcome back to TLP Space News. I'm Zach, and this is your Space News Weekly. A lot happened this week, from strategic shifts in international space collaborations to significant developments in commercial space ventures. Let's dive into all of it. Starting off with a bold move from the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, they've announced a call for proposals for an ambitious lunar orbiter project known as LASSO, the Lunar Assay via Small Satellite Orbiter. The initiative aims to develop a satellite capable of operating in ultra-low lunar orbits as low as just 10 kilometers above the moon's surface to prospect for water ice and test advanced maneuvering technologies. Operating at such low altitudes presents significant challenges due to the moon's uneven gravitational field, requiring consistent adjustments to maintain a stable orbit. Beyond technological advancements, LASSO's mission includes a comprehensive mapping of the lunar regions to identify concentrations of water ice, crucial for those future lunar exploration and presential resource utilization missions. DARPA plans to award contracts for an initial six-month design study, with subsequent phases leading to the construction and launch of the spacecraft in collaboration with NASA. Turning to NASA, the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation has finally scheduled a vote for April 30th on the nomination of Jared Isaacman to serve as the next administrator of NASA. Isaacman, known for commanding the all-civilian Inspiration4 mission and leading the Polaris program with Polaris Dawn, brings a unique blend of the entrepreneurial experience and first-hand spaceflight knowledge to the table. His nomination has sparked both enthusiasm and debate, with supporters highlighting his commitment to advancing space access through public-private partnerships, while critics question the appointment of a non-government figure to lead an agency during a pivotal time for NASA's strategic missions. If confirmed, Isaacman would succeed NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and become the first private astronaut to assume the top position at NASA. Heading into the commercial space sector, Astronus has secured a landmark $115 million contract to deliver Taiwan's first dedicated communications satellite. Partnering with the Chunghua Telecom, Taiwan's largest telecom provider, Astronus will provide a KBA-band satellite designed to enhance the nation's digital infrastructure and resilience against natural disasters and geopolitical uncertainties. This satellite, part of Astronus's Block 3 program, is slated to launch by the end of 2025 aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The deal not only marks Astronus's largest commercial contract to date, but also signifies a strategic move from Taiwan to bolster its independent space capabilities. There were some big executive changes in the commercial industry this week, with German launch startup Rocket Factory Osberg, RFA, announcing Dr. Indelus Kalinis, sorry if I said that wrong, a seasoned aerospace executive with extensive experience in the German space sector has been appointed as the new CEO. This leadership transition comes as RFA focuses on overcoming technical challenges to bring its RFA-1 rocket to the launch pad with plans for a debut launch from Saxford Spaceport in the Shetland Islands later this year. The RFA-1 rocket is designed to carry payloads of up to 1,300 kilograms to low-Earth orbit, positioning RFA as a competitive player in the European small sat launch market. Axiom Space also announced a new CEO this week with the promotion of Tejpal Bahatia, sorry if I said that wrong as well, to the role of Chief Executive Officer. Tej Paul, who has served as the company's Chief Revenue Officer since 2021, who succeeds co-founder Cam Gafarian, who stepped in as interim CEO following the departure of their last CEO last August, he will continue to serve as Axiom's Executive Chairman. During his tenure as Chief Revenue Officer, Tej Paul was instrumental in securing over a billion dollars in contracts, including overseeing Axiom's series of private astronaut missions to the International Space Station. His efforts have been pivotal in positioning Axiom as a leader in the commercial space sector. Prior to joining Axiom, he held significant roles at Google, focusing on cloud computing and was involved in several startup ventures. He also contributed to ESPN's video streaming initiatives, showcasing a diverse background in technology and media. Under his leadership, Axiom looks to continue and advance its ambitious projects, including the development of a private space station and the creation of the next generation spacesuits for NASA's Artemis program. The company's fourth private astronaut mission is slated to launch as early as May, marking another milestone in its expanding portfolio. Now heading up to the International Space Station this week, the ISS saw both crew and cargo spacecraft operations. On April 20th, Soyuz MS-26 spacecraft successfully returned to Earth after undocking from the space station, bringing back Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexei Ovechkin and Ivan Wagner, along with NASA astronaut Donald Patet. 
The capsule landed at 6.20 a.m. local time on the steppes of Kazakhstan, concluding a 220-day mission that began on September 11, 2024. During their time aboard the ISS, the crew orbited Earth 3,520 times and conducted numerous scientific experiments. Following a standard post-landing procedures, the crew underwent a medical evaluations before Ovechkin and Wagner returned to Star City in Russia, and Patet returned to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Less than 24 hours later, SpaceX launched CRS-32, from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida at 4.15 a.m. Eastern Time. The Cargo Dragon autonomously docked to the International Space Station's Harmony Module at 8.40 a.m. on the 22nd. The mission delivered approximately 6,700 pounds of supplies, including scientific investigations, crew provisions, and hardware. Among the notable experiments aboard CRS-32 are studies on DNA inspired by nanomaterials for joint inflammation treatments and the Atomic Clock Ensemble in Space, ACES, project. This project is aimed at enhancing global timekeeping and testing aspects of Einstein's theory of relativity. These events underscore the ongoing seamless operations that are vital to the success of the International Space Station. Now looking to the future of the ISS, NASA and Roscosmos have officially extended their seat barter agreement for crew flights to the ISS through 2027. This agreement ensures continued collaboration aboard the ISS, allowing NASA astronauts to fly on Russian Soyuz spacecraft and Roscosmos cosmonauts to fly on American commercial crew vehicles such as Crew Dragon and Starliner. As part of this extension, Roscosmos will reduce its launch cadence, though, flying just three Soyuz missions over the next two years instead of the regular four, with mission durations now being extended from six months to eight months. This strategic adjustment aims at conserving resources while maintaining an operational role on the ISS, highlighting the enduring spirit of cooperation between the two space agencies despite broader geopolitical tensions. Now turning to budgetary matters, the White House has proposed a significant cut to NASA's science program, slashing nearly 50% of the science mission doctorate and canceling multiple major missions. The proposed budget would reduce NASA's overall funding from approximately $25 billion to $20 billion, with the science mission doctorate budget falling from $7.5 billion to just $3.9. Key programs infected would be the cancellation of the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, and the Mars Sample Return Mission, as well as substantial reductions in Earth science, heliophysics, and planetary science funding. These cuts have sparked concern from the scientific community and members of Congress who warned that such reductions could undermine NASA's ability to carry out its fundamental objectives and hinder the United States' leadership in space science. This week, we saw many unique Earth departures and arrivals. On April 20th, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 carrying a classified payload for the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office, designated NROL 145. Liftoff took place at 1043 UTC or 643 a.m. Eastern Time. Later that same day, or technically the next day in UTC time, SpaceX launched Bandwagon 3. That Falcon 9 lifted off from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida at 048 UTC on April 21st or 848 p.m. Eastern on the 20th. This dedicated rideshare carried just three payloads to a mid-inclination orbit. South Korea's 425 Sat 3, Tomorrow IO's Tomorrow S7 weather satellite, and Atmos Space Cargo Phoenix 1's reentry capsule. It's a smaller manifest than usual for SpaceX, but it showcased their flexibility in adapting to customer needs. Just hours later, SpaceX was back with a launch of CRS-32. That SpaceX Falcon 9 and Cargo Dragon launched from Kennedy Space Center's iconic Launch Complex 39A at 8.15 UTC or 4.15 AM Eastern on the 21st. The mission carried over 6,700 pounds of critical supplies to the ISS. Fast forward to April 24th, a Long March 2F rocket lifted off from the Zhiguan Satellite Launch Center at 9.17 UTC or 5.17 AM Eastern. Aboard it was Shen Zhao 20 with its crew, with Commander Chen and astronauts Chen and Wang, headed for a six-month stay aboard the Tiangong space station in low Earth orbit. Later that day, Falcon 9 took flight once again, launching Starlink 6-74 from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral at 7.15 UTC or 3.15 AM Eastern. The mission deployed 23 Starlink satellites into mid-inclination orbits, continuing the rapid build-out of SpaceX's Starlink constellation. Soyuz MS-26 returned on April 20th, landing at 020 UTC or 8.20 p.m. Eastern on April 19th. On board was NASA astronauts Don Patet, Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexey Ovechkin, and Ivan Wagner. They safely touched down in the Kazakhstan after spending 220 days on the International Space Station. It was a smooth landing, and Patet fittingly returned home right on his 70th birthday. 
On April 22nd, the CRS-32 spacecraft docked to the ISS's Harmony module. Docking occurred at 1240 UTC or 840 AM Eastern, delivering new experiments and supplies for Expedition 71. On April 24th, just a few hours after the launch, Shenzhou-20 docked to the Tiangong station, with docking confirmed at 1547 UTC or 1147 AM Eastern after a smooth six and a half hour fast rendezvous. It was a big week for space news, lots of changes in the commercial sector, in the future of the ISS and a busy launch schedule, and next week isn't slowing down. You can catch all of our launch coverage live over on our main channel, The Launchpad. Stay up to date with the latest on launch windows and mission breakdowns over at tlpnetwork.com, and our weekly pre-launch preview is now live, and you can get all the details of all the launches coming up this next week over on The Launchpad. From our TLP Canada studio, my name's Zach, and we will see you next time for next week's TLP Space News Weekly right here on The Launchpad News.